Welcome to the live that you've been waiting so long for. I don't know. Have you been waiting for it? We'll see. <laughs> this is going to be a running series for the rest of the month. I decided to create a bit of a mini series for Women's History Month and I'm calling it Everyday Miracle Women in History. And so, hey, Sharon, you're another miracle woman in my life. Um, so this is what we're calling it because the the women that I'm going to feature this month are women that have made such powerful moves in history, in our economy, with inventions, uh, in ways that shape our culture that we still live with today. And the women that I chose are women that not everybody has heard of. They're they're like sleeper heroes. Okay, so I wanted to highlight them and bring them to the front for a couple of reasons. The women that I'm featuring are like they're historical. They're they're not modern day women. They're not alive right now, and um, and they're quite a bit older, right? So this is this is before video. This is before we can get a sense of their personality or whatever. So what I wanted to do, hey Courtney, <laughs> so good to see you, Alex. Mwah. Welcome from New York to the UK. What I wanted to do for this series is bring these women to life for you. Because you know when you're reading, um, like you're in social studies in school or you're in, um, like you're in a history book or you're reading some kind of contextual um, time period piece, they're just talking about names on a the paper. They're just talking about um, facts on the paper, but they don't tell a story about who the person really was. And so although I can't exactly identify. <laughs> hey, Ivy. Hey, Ed. Good to see you, bud. Um, I, I'm guessing when I do this, but I'm going to try my best to bring Josephine to life in a way that feels like if she were alive today, this is how she would be. So I'm going to bring you through her story. And um, and Josephine Garris Cochran is the woman I'm going to be talking about today. She is a she is what people are referring to as the um, mother of the modern day dishwasher. This is in the 1800s, right? So we're going to set it back. But what I'm going to do is kind of tell you story style um, about what happened and why the story behind the dishwasher. It's obviously you can assume like, oh, we have a dishwasher it's because everybody hates washing their dishes. That was not always the case. Culturally, at that time and before then, in the 1800s, a lot of people um, enjoyed washing the dishes because it was soothing, but it was also tied to your role as a woman. You were in the, you were, if you were a woman, you were in the household. If you didn't have servants, you were doing the dishes yourself and you identified as a woman who was taking care of the home, who took care of her family, who took care of her surroundings and there was a piece of pride in that so there wasn't like this big huge need like all these women were coming up being like somebody get me a dishwasher this was not happening yet okay so the the point is before I get into this the point is that if women like this in history back then if women like that could do it with the lack of resources that they had then women like us can definitely do it now with all of the opportunity and resources that we have now, period. So that's what I want you to take away from this is that if they can do it, oh, oh yeah, we can do it. Ivy, thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's storytelling super powerful. So I want to bring these amazing powerhouse women to life and give you to context about why it was even more important that they did what they did when they did it. Okay. So here we go. Come with me. Ready, Sharon? Okay. <laughs> All right. Josephine Garris, Garris was her last name, Josephine Garris was this woman, she was, she was this chick that was grown up in the USA, she lived in Shelbyville, Illinois, okay, the year is 1839, the town is Shelbyville, Illinois, alright, so middle of America, sweet little Josephine Garris, she was born, um, into a family of successful inventors, all right? So her grand, her first of all, her father was a um, John Garris. He was a famous civil engineer. And um, her granddad, his name was John Fitch. And guess what he invented? It's no big deal. You might not have ever heard of it. It probably doesn't have anything to do with the way that we travel or vacation. But he did a little thing where he like invented the thing that's like what? A steamboat. Oh yeah, the steamboat, okay. Which Disney, made famous with Steamboat Willie, made famous. It was already famous, okay? It was like huge. So that's her granddad. She's she's this chick that's like among all these men that are like doing big things. They got a problem. They they tactically or technologically figure it out or they invent something to figure it out for them. So, hey, Angela. So, um, Sishanika. Hey, girl. I'm just using my Samsung um, S20. So, um, thank you. Thank you. 
I love the wall paneling. It's really fun. Um, so, so John Fitch is this like super famous inventor guy. And then imagine Josephine Garris. She's she's growing up in Illinois in this like hobunk town or whatever. They've got money. Like, I mean, her family's famous engineer is her dad, and then like huge inventor is her grandfather. Like, they're sitting pretty. But like, it's Shelbyville, Illinois, right? So, she is hanging out among these people that just have this mindset of if there's a problem, we'll solve it. Um, check out the hook while my DJ revolves it. That's the theme of their life. And so she's, she's, but she's a girl. What are girls going to do? Nothing. Okay. So, but like her family solves problems, right? And so that's, that's like the mindset that she had growing up. So she was never trained formally as a mechanic or as an engineer or anything like that. Um, but she was around these people that thought bigger and that like solved problems and stuff. So when Josephine turned 19, she got hooked up with this guy, William Cochran. Let me talk about William. William was a stud, okay? Cochran, spelled C-O-C-H-R-A-N. That's important. That's important. Pause on that for a second. That's important. Think about that. There's an N on the end of that, okay? William Cochran, he's a big deal. He's an investor. He's a business guy. He's like, who wants me? You're 19? That's cool. He was like 24 at the time they were dating. It wasn't like inappropriate or anything, but he was like, you, you're gorgeous. Actually, she's gorgeous. I'm going to put in, um, in the comments right now, I'm going to put in a picture of Josephine Garris because she is a stud herself. So he was lucky to have her. William, shut up. Like you didn't pick her. She picked you. So she was like, you know what, William? I like you. You're pretty rad. But, um, hang on. I'm going to put it in the comments right now. She's like, but I see your last name and I raise you my independence. I'm going to take your last name on. That's cool. But I'm going to put an E on the end of it to make myself different because that's the kind of woman I am. His parents hated that. She didn't care. She's like, you know what though? I'm an independent woman and I'm going to make it my own. And yes, I'll take your name, but like a little middle finger on the side. You know what I mean? So she put her, she put an E on the end of her name. So it's Josephine Garris Cochran with an E on the end. So it's like, if you say it, if you're like, oh, they're the Cochrans, nobody would know. But if you see it, it's kind of like, hmm. So it's a little bit of an F you <laughs> claim on her own independence because this was like very unusual at the time, right? But it's almost like, yes, Ivy, that's how it is. Um, it's almost like, Ivy, you caught my hip hop, you caught the little eyes in there. It's almost like, um, you know, she, it's almost like she could get away with it a little bit because she had some money or whatever. So let me see if I can pop this in the comment for you guys. She's beautiful. Um, maybe, maybe not. So, all right. Her husband's got money. She's a queen. The 1800s aren't going to hold her down. She's like, I got an E on the end of my name. It's kind of like my own name. I'm like a new person. Nobody's related to me. It's cool. And then her husband's got like money. They're upper crust, right? There's high society. They're throwing parties. They've got people over there. Where is this picture? And so she, they're, they're like, they've got servants. They've got money, so they've got servants. So they've got like maids that they pay to do the dishes, to clean up, to do their laundry, to do all of that stuff. So one day this, um, well, not just one day, but like several times it happened where um, the servants were cleaning up after a party and they chipped the china, 1600s china. So this is like 200 year old, 200 plus year old china that Josephine and her husband had. And she was like, hell no, like, no, no, this is not acceptable. I'm going to throw parties and then like I'm paying you people to clean up and then you're going to chip my china to be fair. Maybe she was a bad boss. I don't know. Maybe they were like, I'll chip your china. You don't look at me the right way, Josephine. I don't know. Maybe Josephine is really cool. But anyway, so she was like, servants, you can do your own thing around the house. You can do the cleanup. You can do everything else. But like the dishes are mine. I'm going to protect this 1600s Parisian china. I don't know if it's from Paris, but maybe it was. And so she starts doing the dishes herself. And it was like very quickly that she realized like dish pan hands have got to go. Like this is nasty. I'm high society. I can't be looking raggedy. Like I got to get my manicure set. So no, we're going to fix this problem. So hit pause because while she's thinking about this, while she's iterating these ideas of how am I going to solve this problem with this dishwasher or with this, like this washing your own dishes garbage, like, ew. Um, while this happened, her husband, William Cochran, he was an alcoholic and he ended up dying of his, from his alcoholism. He went away for treatment and he never came home. So what he left her is super sad because she's like, um, you know, she's young and, and this is, this is it. Like she's got a baby that died at two and she's got one other baby and that baby lived and survived, but she's got, so now she's like widowed. She's got 
her, her child died. She's got one child left, and her husband left her with this huge amount of debt. He only gave her, left her like $1,500 that time money. So she was like struggling, right? And the debt was mounting, and it was gonna, something had to happen. So it was amazing timing actually that this happened because she's got the idea now. And if she didn't have an idea, like what was she gonna do? But she had this idea, now she had to make something happen for herself, right? Um, if, if she didn't figure out this like invention and, and create a success out of it, she was gonna be screwed. So full disclosure, full disclosure, there was a patent, or there, yeah, there was a patent for a dishwasher in 1850, but that was not, it wasn't efficient. Uh, people never got around to even hearing about it because no, nobody ever even wanted, it wasn't good. So as far as everybody else in the world was concerned, there's no dishwasher, there's no such thing. We don't know what it is. We don't know that we want one, whatever. Okay, okay back to Queen Josephine, okay. So she wanted a machine to do the work, the work for her because she's a modern woman and she's like, I can do better. Um, I don't trust my servants and I can do better. So um, she didn't have any formal training in mechanics or engineering or anything, like I said, but what are we going to do when we got to figure something out? We find a way. We ask who we need to connect with. Remember this, ladies. Who do we need to talk to? Not like, what are we going to do? How are we going to figure it out? It's like, who do we need to talk to? Who knows who knows who that can connect me with the people who I need to align with this mission that I'm on to like get it done, right? So she was like, wait, I got a guy. I got a guy. Her buddy, George Butters. Don't laugh. Spelled like the dairy product, okay? Um, <laughs> he was a mechanic and he'd been her friend for a while. So she's like, bro, come over. You're going to want to hear my idea. It's killer. And he's like, okay, I'm going to come over. So he comes over and she's like, G money, I got this idea. And he's like, would you just call me? And she's like, G money. And he's like, I'll just George, please. And she's like, okay, whatever, George, I've got this idea. Okay. And I've got the plan. I just need you to like figure out the like who's and what's it to put it together and like make the thing. Okay. So she is, um, <laughs> Hey, Hey Joanne. Hey Irene. Um, so like he's, he's a mechanic, so he can figure out the physical pieces and she's got the idea. So, um, together she's like if if i go if i like i've got this idea i'm going to map it out on paper you help me with the technological components and you can become a employee of mine when i'm a famous inventor and have a huge company okay and he's like okay so josephine went back into the house and she was like um she grabbed the tape like the tape measure ribbon thing that they had back then they didn't have the retractable ones they weren't that cool yet this is the 1800s like let's go so she's measuring dishes she's measuring sa saucers cups whatever in her kitchen right and she's like Okay, how this thing, how big is this thing gonna need to be? And she starts measuring her dishes, and um, she was gonna create this metal wire housing for the dishes, cups, and saucers to sit in, so they wouldn't move, right? And um, she went to the backyard. That's where she had her shed, and she was like, "Let's do this." So she went to the backyard, and um, with the help of George, G Money, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what his friends called him. Um, a, a white dude from the 1800s, definitely. So they went back to the shed, and the shed is where this all went down. She's in the shed, she's mapping it out, he's getting the components for her. Um, they've got this wire casing that they created, and this is where, basically think of your dishwasher, it's like where the where the plates would go, like the in-between, right? The little racks where you place your dishes so that they can stand up. That's what she was trying to create. It was like a very rudimentary project at the time, of course, because it was like, this was their, their beta version. So. Um, <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> so, um, this is the first model of the automatic dishwasher and the way that it worked, like picture your dishwasher in your kitchen. It's not that different, but the right now in your dishwasher, you pull the drawers out and the water's up here and, and down below. And it's like squirting and spraying and going crazy. And like the water's super, super hot, like 80 to 130 degrees or whatever. And it's getting everything done at this time it was scrubbing the scrubbing was the mechanism for any kind of dishwasher that they were going to be doing so for her to be like i'm going to just use water pressure it was like bing like nobody ever thought of that it's like when the romans were like aqueducts everyone's like what okay so josephine's doing this and the difference now picture your dishwasher the difference is the water's moving in hours now but what was different then is that the water was stationary and then the rack was on like a like it was like a, a circular plate, like a, a wheel. So the wheel was like turning. So the dishes are on here. Here's my dishes, ready? <laughs> so the dishes are here and it's turning like this so that the, when the water is spraying on top, like everything's getting done, getting cleaned and whatever. So 
So she figured out, she's like, I'm going to run tubes for hot water with soap. And so that's going to get all bubbly and crazy. And then I'm going to do another water line that's going to be just water. And it's going to, it's going to go through like a heated coil, heat it up so that when it rinses, it's fine because the previous version had cold water running through it and cold water, we know does not do a good job getting film off the dishes. And no, thank you. So Josephine had it all handled. She's like, I got the issues. I'm going to solve for the problems that I know are going to exist. And, um, and so her friends, her friends, ready? America, G money. We know, we know. So her friends were upper crust with her, right? Like they're, they're rich, whatever. So she, you know, she's a wealthy woman. She lives in a mansion in Illinois. Like she's throwing epic parties. So these chicks had money that she was friends with and they were probably, they probably had China too. And they were probably like, my servants don't respect my Parisian China either. And every time I have a party, like somebody's doing something stupid. So, I mean, they're good with the floors, but come on, like, in my head, this is how the conversation went with them. There's no way of knowing if this is true or not. But um, so a handful of friends actually did start buying her dishwasher, her first version of her own dishwasher. And then um, she was like, okay, hey, I'm going to, these ladies love it. I'm going to start selling it in the local newspapers. It's like, good idea, right? Yeah. She's like, I'm, I'm an inventor. I'm like a businesswoman. I can solve problems and I'm beautiful. Everybody shut up. So then she was running ads in the paper, but most households didn't catch on because remember the time, this is late 1800s. So most of the homes didn't have like adequate plumbing. They didn't have like a lot of hot water because they didn't have hot water tanks big enough to do something for like an industrial process, like a dishwasher. So the, their hot water tanks were small enough to set up for just like a bath. You know what I mean? So they weren't ready for this. They just weren't ready for this. So that's why like her rich friends were like, I'll take one, I'll take two. No, you won't. You'll take one. Let's not get crazy. So they were like, a handful of them went out to her friends, but they had the money and they had the hot water tanks so they could do it. So, um, so this is how that happened for them. And then, um, but the rest of society at that time was not caught up yet. So, all right. At the same time, they didn't have the plumbing they didn't have the plumbing support for the everyday person, right? And I mentioned that society was still like, hey, listen, a woman's work is in the kitchen, all right? We got it. We got it. We don't need your toys, Josephine. And she's like, I'm a queen. You will need my toy. I'm going to write that down that you said that, and I'm going to make you eat your words later because this thing is so epic. So, but at the time, commercial places, think hotels, think restaurants, think big buildings. They had hot water tanks big enough. They had this stuff available. So this is going to work for them. So... And later on, like seriously, when the plumbing caught up, these women were like, I'm so sorry, Josephine, will you please take me back and let me buy your dishwasher? She's like, maybe. So, but right away, restaurants, restaurants, hotels, they would catch on. So she went to the Palmer House in Chicago. It was a hotel in Chicago and they bought one. And she was like, oh my gosh, is this possible? This is possible. I just had evidence to say that this is possible. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to try harder. So she wanted a bigger contract. She wanted um, something that would like make a dent in her goals. Because remember, her husband's dead. She's got mounds of debt. She lives in this big mansion. She's got to pay for stuff. And she's like a woman. Women aren't supposed to have money by themselves. It's 1800. It's like, you're just a woman. So she's like, mm, bootstraps, let's go. So she contacted the Sherman House Hotel in Chicago, which is like a bomb hotel at the time. Everyone was like, oh, do you, do you stay at the Sherman House? Only if you're rich. So you know what she did? This is what she did. She friggin' cold called. She cold called the Sherman House Hotel hotel in Chicago to meet with the manager. I'm going to have you pause with me right now. She cold called it. Okay. <laughs> this was the 19th century. Okay. Women couldn't vote. Women couldn't wear pants. Like women couldn't just walk around in public unsupervised. Okay. So you couldn't just walk around because if you walked around, you were a hussy. You were a street walker. You were a night worker. So like you got to have a man on your arm because you're inappropriate as a woman, because all you are is like used for certain things in house cleaning, okay? So that you just can't be walking around in the world. <laughs> That's crazy. So the fact that women of high society were going to, like, if, if she was, by the way, this is a time, like this is a time, 1800s. This is a time where they were selling cocaine in children's teething tablets. It was like cocaine tablets, like for kids. Like this is the, this is what was happening back then. They're like, women, you can't wear pants. So this is, and she was going to contact the manager of a hotel and talk to him about selling her dishwasher to him. So the fact that um, she would walk alone unsupervised into a hotel, what does that say about you? You're a woman walking alone in the 1800s into a hotel. Rumor mill is about to go down, okay? So this is like, 
So imagine Josephine, and when I say cold calling, I mean like walking into the building, like no phone, like she's walking in a cold call walk-in. And so rumor mill is going to go nuts if you're caught alone in public, and Josephine Cochran's walking into this hotel alone. Her husband's dead, so he's not supervising her. Um, this is scandalous, okay? So, and cold calling's barf city as it is. Like, who wants to cold call ever? Even now. Like, nobody wants to cold call, okay? Like, there's that weird, like, sociopathic people that are, like, really good at cold calling, and I honor them. And there's so sociopathic behaviors. But, um, and, like, they're good at what they do. But, dear God. What? Okay, so nobody wants to cold call. She told... A reporter at one time I'm gonna hang on I'm gonna read what she said because she actually she was quoted um, oh gosh I can't imagine cold calling at this time so she made her she made up her mind right and here's what she said to a reporter at the time she said you asked me what the hardest part about getting into business was I think crossing the lobby of the Sherman House Hotel alone I had never been anywhere without my husband or father these are her words the lobby seemed a mile wide I thought I should faint at every step but I didn't, and I got an $800 order as my reward. She, this is how bad it was for her. She was, like, <laughs> walking through this, like, mile-wide-seeming lobby to get to the manager, um, and, like, she thought she was going to faint at every step. Imagine that physiology, okay? And she's coming in, and then she left with an $800 order. When I Googled it, because Google is so smart, um, Google's like, hey, $800 back then is about twenty five k today. All right. So she was like, 25K is cool. That's amazing. Now that I've got my feeling back in my body, I've got plans. All right. I want to go bigger. So she went to the Chicago World Expo in 1893. All right. Late 1800s. She entered her dishwasher. She was the only woman in the expo to appear as an inventor. Like there were women there, but like they weren't inventors. Okay. So this is Josephine. And she's like, whatever. Guess what happened? She won first place for the best mechanical construction durability and adaptation to its to its line of work. So that was the category for her. She won first place in it. She sold her dishwashers like mad after that, okay? And because the the World Expo is like anytime there was a World Expo held, it was like the buzz of the nation. Like all over the newspapers everywhere, the award winners were like celebrities, like everybody knew about it. So she was getting now she was getting famous. She was getting she was getting um, notoriety. She's getting commercial contracts for this stuff, and she was selling them individually even up until she died in 1913. So she died at 74 years old. She died on my birthday. I didn't even know that until yesterday, and I was like, "Wait, Josephine, gang, gang." So three years later, three years later after she died, Hobart was the company that bought her company. The Josephine was the. Josephine Garris Dishwashing Machine Company or something. I should get that right, but I don't, I don't remember it exactly. But I'll put it in the chat if anyone actually cares. Um, but the Hobart Company became KitchenAid. KitchenAid is part of the Whirlpool Company, okay? So all of these, all of these dishwashers that we're using, they're like grandbabies of her dishwasher is what happened. She's like, these are my family members. Look at them, and you're using them. So we are basically kind of like granddaughters, step-granddaughters of Josephine. Garris Cochran with an E? Uh, maybe. So, but this woman, she's now like, she's dead and gone and she's helping people find more time with their families, do things, do things that they like doing better than washing dishes, um, be super efficient, like more time to catch up with friends, exercise, take a nap, focus on their business. Like taking domestic chores away and letting a machine do it is brilliant, obviously. But when, look at when she did it. She did it in the late 1800s, and she did it when women weren't supposed to do stuff or wear pants, when, when babies were eating cocaine tablets. This is when she did this, okay? And now the world is using dishwashers all over the place. And in the UK, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but the dishwashers and the laundry units are also in the kitchen in most places. That's what I hear. I think that's crazy. We have laundry rooms for that. We keep our dirty clothes separate from our food because gross. So um, anyway, so... This is a, you know, what I wanted to say is that in an era where men were the ones doing everything, where men were the ones getting notoriety, they were investing, they were inventing, Mrs. Josephine Garris Cochran didn't let something as insignificant as gender stand in the way of her genius idea and her ability to get it done. So as we celebrate Women's History Month this month, think of it all month long, think of it, you're a woman own it, love it, think about what you can be doing as we celebrate 
Women's History Month, Josephine Garris Cochran, cheers to you and everything that you did to move us forward. So I'm going to catch you. I'm going to catch up with these comments, first of all, because you guys, I can't even see this far away, what's happening in my life. Um, but I will actually, I'm going to catch up in case you guys are like legitimately talking to me and asking for questions. Um, yeah, Trisha, say a little prayer for Josephine every time you load your dishwasher. Courtney, I hate pants. <laughs> pants are so stupid. <laughs> pants are so stupid. And, and a dress is easier. Listen, a dress is an outfit. You don't have to like put anything together. You just like put it on. <laughs> so much easier. We thought that like pants would make us independent, but we're like, mm, how about sweatpants? <laughs> it didn't really work like we thought it would. <laughs> so, um, yes. Okay. So Ivy, she did think of mass production. So mass production was happening at that time because the under industrial age was, was happening. It was going on at the time, but, um, but she got the, she got Hobart to mass produce her line of dishwashers for her. And, that, and that's how that was. And Hey Mara. So, um, so yeah, Irene, I honor you, Josephine. Yeah. And listen, I will put her, I'm going to put, check the comments in like a minute. I'm going to, as soon as I get off this live, I'm going to put her picture in here. You guys are going to love her face. She's just like, she's like Beyonce of the dishwasher world. Oh, that's not even good enough. She's like Beyonce of the 1800s, okay? Like a white Beyonce. That's what she is. And from middle America, Illinois. Mm. So just north of Texas, where Beyonce is from. So there you go. So I'm going to catch you next week, same time, same channel, as we celebrate Women's History Month here in March, all across the world. And we're going to celebrate some epic moves by some amazing ladies. So I'm going to get back to these comments, and I will put a picture of our Queen Bee, Josephine, in the chat and I will see you guys next week.